Paddington's first Christmas with the Browns was a day to remember. The night before, on Mrs Bird's instructions, he'd hung a pillowcase on the end of his bed, and next morning he found to his surprise that it was full of parcels. Paddington liked parcels, and he lost no time in opening them. There was a chemistry outfit, a new scrapbook from Mr Gruber, A xylophone. Soon the whole house was awake. I'm as patriotic as the next man, grumbled Mr. Brown, but I draw a line when bears start playing the national anthem at six o'clock in the morning. There's no need to stand to attention, Henry, said Mrs. Brown. I'm not standing to attention. I'm stuck to the floor. Look. Oh, gosh, said Judy. That must be the instant glue I gave him for his new scrapbook. Christmas, groaned Mr. Brown. Perhaps you'd like to give a hand with the dinner, Paddington, said Mrs. Bird. There's a lot to be done. I could test your gravy with some litmus paper from my new chemistry set, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington. Bears are very good at testing gravy. See what I mean? Paddington had never eaten one of Mrs. Bird's Christmas dinners before, but he had to admit it was worth waiting for. The table was groaning with good things. There was an enormous plate of turkey to start with, which he soon polished off, and that was followed by mince pies, which went the same way, but best of all was Mrs. Bird's Christmas pudding with custard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Paddington, mm -hmm. what do you think of it? Was it worth waiting for? It was very nice, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington, except I had a bone in my Christmas pudding. A bone, repeated Mrs. Brown. You can't have a bone in a Christmas pudding. Hmm? I did, said Paddington firmly. It was all hard. I nearly broke a tooth. Mercy me, you know what he's done. Quick, said Mr. Brown, we'd better turn him upside down. And before Paddington had time to say anything else, he found himself standing on his head in a corner of the room. Try jumping up and down, suggested Mrs. Brown. I, uh, I'm trying to, only it's not easy with paws. Perhaps we could try using a magnet, suggested Jonathan. I've got a great big one upstairs. A magnet, repeated Paddington. I've never heard of a bone magnet before. It's not a bone, said Judy. It's a fivepenny piece. It's supposed to be lucky. If you find it, you can make a wish. Lucky, repeated Paddington. I don't see anything lucky about nearly swallowing a fivepence. I feel sick. You mean you haven't swallowed it? Mr and Mrs Brown looked at each other. Why ever didn't you say, asked Judy. Nobody asked me, said Paddington. He was about to wish he'd not eaten quite so much Christmas dinner. Then he changed his mind. For really it had been quite the nicest one he'd ever had. So instead he made another wish. Then he pointed to his fivepence. Perhaps you'd like a go now, Mr Brown, he suggested. Uh, no, thank you. I think perhaps I'll leave it until next Christmas. And the way time flies, it won't be long to wait. That's funny, Mr. Brown. That means my wish is starting to come true already. One morning, Paddington came hurrying downstairs as fast as his legs would carry him, and he burst into the dining room looking as if his very life depended on it. 
Good gracious, exclaimed Mr. Brown, what on earth's the matter? Look out of the window, cried Paddington. Everything's gone white in the night. Look at it. It's all right, said Judy. There's nothing to worry about. It's only snow. It happens every winter, said Jonathan. Snow, said Paddington. What's snow? It's a nuisance, said Mr. Brown. It'll have to be cleared away before I can get the car out. Don't worry, said Jonathan. We'll do it for you. Come on, Paddington, you can bring your bucket and spade and lend a paw. Paddington decided he liked snow, especially the brown sort. He made several journeys up and down the path outside their garage. Then he turned his attention to the back garden. It was as he reached the fence that an idea suddenly struck him. He was always getting into trouble with the brown's neighbour, Mr Curry, and he felt it might be a chance to do him a good turn and clear some of his paths too. In fact, taken all round, it was a good chance to kill several birds with one stone. Jonathan and Judy were busy making a snowman, so he tipped several bucketfuls of Mr Curry's snow over the fence in case they ran out. Caught you, yelled Jonathan. Come on, Paddington, let's have a snowball fight. Paddington needed no second bidding. Having a snowball fight sounded even more fun than clearing pathways. Watch out, he cried, it's coming. <coughs> At least, I think it is. Yeah, miss me by a mile. You'd better get some practice in. Paddington decided that throwing snowballs was much more difficult than it looked, especially with paws. So he thought he would put another plan into operation. On the way up the garden, he did Mr Curry yet another good turn by closing his back door for him. He felt sure he wouldn't want all the cold air going into his house. Then he crept towards another part of the fence in hope of catching Jonathan by surprise. Bear! You've been throwing snowballs, Bear! Snowballs? repeated Paddington. Did you say snowballs, Mr Curry? Yes, snowballs. A large one came through my bedroom window just now and landed on my hot water bottle. It's melted in the middle of my bed. Oh dear, said Paddington. I wouldn't do a thing like that on purpose, Mr Curry. Besides, it would be much too difficult to get it through a window, especially a large snowball like that. Like what, Bear? Like the one you said landed on your bed, Mr Curry. Brr, well, I must say you've made a good start on my snow. <coughs> I'm going indoors now, but if you do the rest of the garden by the time I'm dressed, I may give you a penny later on. One measly penny for clearing a whole garden, exclaimed Jonathan. There's no justice in this world. Oh, I don't know, said Judy. Perhaps there is. Look. Bear, bellowed Mr Curry, did you shut this door? You've locked me out of my own house. Where are you, Bear? Come back here at once. I think he may have gone that way, said Jonathan. Or was it that way, asked Judy. Perhaps, said Paddington hopefully, I might even have gone that way, Mr. Curry. Whichever it was, I'm not coming this way again today. One day, Mrs. Brown left Paddington outside Crumble and Ferns so that he could do some secret Christmas shopping on his own. But it wasn't as easy as it looked. 
In fact, he landed on a tie pin and it was very painful. Crumbled and Ferns was a very old established shop and once you managed to get through the revolving doors, it felt as though time had stood still. It was the kind of shop where the assistants were rarely taken by surprise. So when Paddington announced that he'd come to buy a clothesline, the man scarcely raised his eyebrows, especially when he caught sight of the diamond tie pin on Paddington's duffel coat. Perhaps, he said, you would like to consider one of our special expanding clotheslines, sir? as used by some of the best families in the country. You'd be surprised if I told you the names of some of our customers. Mine's for Mrs. Bird, said Paddington. I'm buying her a new one for Christmas. Hers broke the other day. Well, we can't have that, sir. Perhaps you'd like to test it. I'm sure it won't let your uh, Mrs. Bird's washing down. Thank you very much, said Paddington. It couldn't be more simple. The box contains over 100 yards of best clothesline, and as you pull, it unwinds itself. Then, when you've finished, you simply... Oh. Oh, dear me. Mr. Wainwright, have you seen a young bear gentleman wearing a blue duffel coat go past? He went that way, towards the China department. Sounds as though he's arrived. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Follow that box. Paddington helped himself to a bullseye. The clothesline had turned out to be much longer than he'd expected. Now he was lost and he definitely felt in need of some refreshment. Ah, there you are, said the assistant. I suppose you realise you've tied everyone up in knots. What have you done with the end of the line? It's here, huh? said Paddington. At least, it was a moment ago. What was that? asked the assistant. I said it's here. <coughs> the assistant stared at him. For some strange reason, he seemed suddenly to have lost the use of his hearing. Do speak up, he exclaimed. I can't understand a word you're saying. Oh dear, said Paddington. I think my bullseye must have fallen in your ear. Your bullseye, repeated the man, fallen in my ear. I'm afraid it's a bit slippery where I've been sucking it, began Paddington. You've been sucking a bullseye in crumbled and fern. But for the second time that morning, the assistant found that he was talking to himself. Paddington had decided it was high time he did one of his disappearing tricks again. He arrived outside the shop just as a very important looking gentleman was about to go in, and they were soon deep in conversation. That's Sir Grisham Gibbs, whispered the commissioner. That young bear found a highly valuable type in belonging to him only this morning. It wasn't very difficult, said Paddington. I sat on it by mistake. Nevertheless, an example to us all. James, as a reward, I would like to place my car at your disposal for the rest of the day. James! I don't think we shall get back into Crumbled and Ferns for a while. They appear to have some rope caught in their entrance. Perhaps you'd like to continue your shopping elsewhere. I think that would be a very good idea, Mr. Gibbs, announced Paddington. Especially if James can find a clothesline shop without revolving doors that sells bullseyes as well. I've left my last one in someone's ear. By mistake. One day, Mr. Gruber decided to take Paddington on a mystery outing. He gave him a bar of chocolate for his lunch, and they set out early in order to avoid the crowds. Paddington liked outings with Mr. Gruber, and to have a mystery thrown in as well seemed very good value indeed. Wait until you get inside, said Mr. Gruber. You're in for a surprise. Paddington grew more and more mystified. 
The building seemed to be full of people in strange clothes, standing about doing nothing. I shan't be a moment, Mr. Gruber, he called. I just want to buy some souvenirs. He hurried over to a nearby kiosk and raised his hat politely, several times, to the lady behind the counter. But, for some strange reason, she didn't reply. Excuse me, he announced. I'd like three large postcards, please. One for my scrapbook, one for Aunt Lucy, and one for Mr. Gruber. I don't think you're going to be very lucky. I think she's made of wax, Mr. Brown. Made of wax, exclaimed Paddington. He gave the lady a hard stare. I've never heard of anyone being made of wax before. You'll find a lot of people like that in here, Mr. Brown. Most of them aren't real at all. It's what's known as a waxworks museum. Mr. Gruber went off to buy some tickets. And after he'd gone, Paddington gazed round the hall. Apart from having no souvenirs, his chocolate was beginning to melt. Not wishing to offend his friend, he looked for somewhere to deposit it. And nearby, he thought he saw the very thing. Here, said the attendant. What do you think you're doing? That's my ticket box. It's not for the likes of young bears to drop their remains in. I'm very sorry, exclaimed Paddington. I thought you were a waxworks like everyone else. Waxworks? I'll give you waxworks. Come back here. But Paddington was already making good his escape. Hurrying down some stairs, as fast as his legs would carry him, he found himself in another large room, full of figures. Worse still, he could hear the sound of voices getting nearer and nearer. And he decided there was only one thing for it. He would have to become a waxworks himself. And this group, said a voice, represents England at the time of Charles I. In the middle is Oliver Cromwell, about to join the Hyansides. If that's Oliver Cromwell, said a woman, then aim the Queen of Sheba. Besides, they never wore duffel coats in them days, agreed a man. Horrible complained another woman. Don't look, Deirdre. I don't know, said her husband. Horrible it may be, but fancy making all them whiskers out of wax. Oh, shrieked Deirdre. I'm sure I saw his nose move. There you are. I told you so. He's done it again. Paddington decided he was fed up. Apart from an itchy nose, he was beginning to wish he'd picked an easier pose. And he felt hungry. I'm not Oliver Cromwell about to join the Ironsides, he announced. I'm Paddington Bear, and I'm about to feed my insides. Good afternoon. I doubt if even Oliver Cromwell could have made a better exit than that, said Mr. Gruber later that day. And he couldn't have surprised his audience more. It's in all the evening papers. Waxworks Museum Latest, Chamber of Horrors, Mystery, Deepens. Lots of people go on mystery outings, Mr. Brown, but not many can say they've actually taken part in one. Paddington considered the matter. Although he hadn't managed to buy any postcards, he felt sure the newspaper cuttings would look very good in his scrapbook. All the same, I'm glad I didn't live in Mr. Cromwell's time, he announced. It must have been difficult drinking cocoa in a helmet. And I'm sure he never went on such nice outings. One day, Paddington bought himself a camera in the market. It had a tripod, and a hood to keep out the light, and there was even a book of instructions. Altogether, it seemed very good value indeed. So after taking a quick bite of a marmalade sandwich, he got ready to take his first picture. There was a very interesting chapter in the instruction book on taking action shots. 
but it wasn't as easy as it sounded. In the end, he decided to take a family group. It seemed much safer. I hope he's not long, said Mr. Brown. I've got cramp coming on. I wouldn't move if I were you, said Jonathan. We'd never hear the last of it, agreed Judy. He's only got one plate. I've only got one leg, groaned Mr. Brown. Shh, Henry, said Mrs. Brown. I think he's doing something. Paddington consulted his instruction book. I have to measure the distance, he announced. I'll use this piece of string. If I don't measure the distance properly, I shan't know how far away you are, and you may come out all blurred. I'd sooner be blurred than have my ear pulled off, grumbled Mr. Brown. Ooh! I'm afraid bear's slip knots are a bit hard to untie, said Paddington. Anyway, I think I shall have to ask you all to move. The sun's in a different place. Perhaps if one of us took it, said Mrs. Bird, you could be in the picture yourself. Paddington considered the matter over a marmalade sandwich. I shall press the shutter, he announced, and then run round the front. Even bears can't run that fast, murmured Mr. Brown. Paddington gave Mr. Brown a hard stare through his lens. But as he did so, something very strange happened. What on earth's he up to now? exclaimed Mr. Brown. He looks as if he's practising for the ballet or something. Mind my petunias. Too late, groaned Jonathan. Are you all right? called Mrs. Brown. I think so, Mrs. Brown, said Paddington, except I've pressed the shutter by mistake. I'm afraid I've been having trouble with a bumblebee again. It must have been after my marmalade sandwich. Perhaps I'd better finish it before anything else happens. No one least of all Paddington, expected his photograph to come out. But to everyone's surprise, when the plate was developed and printed, there was quite a clear picture. Not bad, said Mr. Brown. Not bad at all. Uh, what is it? Take a look in my window, said the man. Paddington hurried outside in order to see for himself. Apart from his photograph, there was a label. It said, Picture of a bumblebee taken by local bear, both very rare. Paddington was in a mess, and for once it wasn't entirely his fault. The person most to blame was a lady called Granny Green. Granny Green wrote cookery articles for one of Mrs. Brown's magazines, and it was her recipe for oldie-fashioned butter toffee that was really the cause of Paddington's downfall. If it hadn't appeared on the very day Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird were out shopping, Paddington might not have been quite so tempted to have a go himself. He tried adding some more ingredients for good measure. But for once, luck didn't seem to be on his side. When he went to stir it, he found the toffee had already set hard. Paddington gazed gloomily at the saucepan. All Granny Green's saucepans were as bright as a new pin. There was certainly no mention of any of them having spoons stuck inside them. Nor, for that matter, 
were her kitchen windows all steamed up. Paddington decided it was high time he cleaned them before they set hard too. Toffee steam was very sticky. It was then that he had his second shock of the day. As he rubbed the glass clean, he caught sight of Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird outside. They appeared to be trying to say something, but he didn't stop to see what it was. Instead, he sat down and waited for the storm to break. What on earth's been going on? cried Mrs. Bird. I've been trying my poor toffee making, said Paddington sadly. I thought it would be a surprise. Toffee? It looks more like glue to me. I've never seen such a mess, agreed Mrs. Bird. I suggest a certain young bear had better get down on his paws and knees and scrub my kitchen floor. Mrs. Bird paused. While she'd been talking, a strange look had come over Paddington's face. Is anything the matter? she asked. I'm not sure, Mrs. Bird, gasped Paddington. I, ooh, I've got a bit of a pain in my stomach and I, ooh, I can't put my legs out straight. Ooh. You haven't been eating this stuff, have you? Well, I did test it once or twice, Mrs. Brown, groaned Paddington. Wish I hadn't now. Gracious me, no wonder you've got a pain. It's probably set in a hard lump inside. I'll call an ambulance. An ambulance? Bears, said Mrs. Bird grimly, have emergencies the same as anyone else. I shall dial 999. Oh, groaned Paddington. Couldn't you dial 111 instead, Mrs. Bird? It would be a lot quicker. Sir Mortimer Carraway opened the door of the hospital emergency ward and peered round the waiting room. Are you all that young bear's next of kin? he asked. The Browns exchanged anxious glances. Somehow they had expected a much longer wait. Well, he lives with us, said Mrs. Brown, but he comes from darkest Peru. Is he going to be all right? asked Judy. I think he'll pull through. Bad case of galloping toffee drips. Most unusual. On the stomach, too. Worst possible place. Galloping toffee drips, repeated Mr. Brown. I think I must have spilt some on my fur by mistake, explained Paddington. I had my duffel coat open when I was stirring it. I expect it set hard when I sat down for a rest. I'm afraid this will leave him with a bare patch for a week or two, but a strict diet of marmalade will soon make it grow again. Perhaps I could glue it back on with some more toffee, said Paddington, hopefully. If you don't mind, said Sir Mortimer, I shall keep it. I've never had a bear's emergency before, and I'd like to have this fur framed. In that case, said Paddington, perhaps I'd better start on my diet straight away, Sir Mortimer. Otherwise, I might catch cold before it grows again, and then you'd have another emergency on your hands. One evening, the Browns settled down to watch a television quiz program called Lucky for Some. To their surprise, instead of seeing Ronnie Playfair, the quiz master, Paddington appeared on the screen. It's all right, Mrs. Bird, he announced. Mr. Gruber's with me. Uh, yes, said Ronnie Playfair. Hello, everyone. Well, now, tonight you have a choice of subjects, geography, history, or mathematics. I think I'd like to try my port mathematics, please, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington. Bears are good at sums. Fancy choosing maths, exclaimed Jonathan. Knowing that bear, it may be a wise choice. He keeps his accounts very well. Good, well, here's a nice easy one to start with. For five pounds, how many buns make five? Two and a half, said Paddington. Two and a half? You wouldn't like to try again? No, thank you, said Paddington firmly. Then I'm afraid you're out of the contest. But I always share my buns, said Paddington. I break them in half. Here, here, give Mr. Prown the money, shouted a voice which sounded suspiciously like Mr. Gruber's. 
Uh, yes, well, we'll try again. Here's an eight-foot plank. If you cut it in half, then cut those two pieces in half, then cut all the pieces in half again. How many pieces would you have? Eight, said Paddington. Very good. Now, for 25 pounds, how long will each of the pieces be? Eight feet, said Paddington. I think. Eight feet? You're sure you won't change your mind? Quite sure, thank you, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington. Oh, Paddington, cried Judy. I told you we shouldn't have chosen maths, said Jonathan. I'm afraid the answer's one foot. You'd have eight pieces each one foot long. Not if you cut them down the middle, said Paddington firmly. If you cut them down the middle, you'd have eight pieces eight feet long. He's right. Give him the money. Give him the money. Ronnie Playfair gazed at Paddington. One last question, he said. And this time it's for 100 pounds. Why ever doesn't he stop now and make sure of what he's got, said Mrs. Brown? If it takes two men 20 minutes to fill a bath using one tap, how long will it take one man to fill the same bath using both taps? You have 10 seconds starting from now. No time at all, said Paddington promptly. Wrong. It will take him exactly half the time. It's on the card. I'm very sorry, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington politely, but you did say it was the same bath and nobody let the first lot of water out. He's right, exclaimed Mr. Brown. Give him the money. Don't be silly, Henry. He can't hear you. I don't know so much, said Judy. Look. Back in the studios, Ronnie Playfair seemed to be making the best of a bad job. Congratulations, Bear, he said grudgingly. You've won the jackpot. I've won a jackpot, exclaimed Paddington hotly. He directed a hard stare at the quizmaster. Uh, containing 100 crisp new one-pound notes. Gosh, said Jonathan, a hundred pounds, good old Paddington. The point is, what will you do with it all? Paddington considered the matter for a moment. I think he announced at last, I'd like to give it to the home for retired bears in Lima, where my Aunt Lucy lives. They only have marmalade on Sundays, so I expect it will come in very useful. I think you'd better send the pot as well. If they have a hundred pounds of marmalade, they'll need something to put it all in. Thank you, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington. Perhaps I could help you with your program another day. I could try my poor geography next time. Bears are good at that, too. One day, to Paddington's surprise, he arrived downstairs for tea, only to find the Browns were holding a party in his honour. All the family were there, Mrs. Bird, Mr. Curry, and Mr. Gruber. I've brought you a book on paper tearing, Mr. Brown. I thought you might be able to entertain us. I like paper tearing tricks. I hope they're good. Paddington hurried over to the table in order to consult his new book. The first one, Mr. Curry, he said, is called The Mystery of the Disappearing Banknote. I'm afraid I've left my wallet in my other jacket, said Mr. Brown. And I only have silver, said Mr. Gruber. I think it's up to you, Mr. Curry. All right, but hope you know what you're doing, Bear. Oh, yes, Mr. Curry, announced Paddington. Mr. Gruber's book has even got pictures showing you how to do it. Now, I take the note and I fold it in two, and then I fold it in two again, then I tear bits out of it. Oh, dear. His face dropped as he consulted his book. Then I put it under my hat. What are you doing now, Bear? growled Mr. Curry. Oh, oh dear, I'm afraid something's gone wrong, Mr. Curry. The banknote was supposed to turn up inside your ear. Have you tried looking in the other one, dear? asked Mrs. Brown. 
I think I turned over two pages at once, said Paddington. I've done the paper doily trick by mistake. What? bellowed Mr. Cutting. Doily? That's my pound note. It's full of holes. Don't worry, Paddington. I'll pay. It won't have to come out of your bun money. Anyway, we have a surprise for you. We've had a cable from the Home for Retired Bears in Lima. It seems your Aunt Lucy is celebrating her hundredth birthday soon, Mr. Brown. Fancy being a hundred, exclaimed Jonathan. Bears' years are different, said Judy. They have two birthdays a year for a start. Anyway, we wondered if you'd like to be there. Paddington sat down in order to consider the matter. His mind was in such a whirl. I don't know what to say, he murmured. I shouldn't say anything, said Mrs. Bird. Have a piece of cake instead. I made it specially. It's got bon voyage written on it. That means we hope you have a good journey. Thank you very much, everybody, said Paddington. But if I'm going back to Peru, I think perhaps I'd better go upstairs and pack. Don't be long, called Judy. Your cocoa will get cold. <coughs> It'll seem very quiet without you, Bear, called Mr. Curry. I don't know who'll do my old jobs for me. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Brown. Oh, well, no more marmalade stains on the walls. I shall leave them on. I'm not having them washed off for anyone. Crumbs, cried Judy. Here he comes again. That was quick. I've packed my things, announced Paddington, but I've left my flannel out in case I need a wash before I leave. You've packed, repeated Mrs. Bird. But what about all the stuff in your room? I'm only taking my important things, said Paddington. I shall leave everything else upstairs for safety. Mr. and Mrs. Brown exchanged glances. Paddington, said Mrs. Bird, you'll never know how happy you've made us feel. We thought perhaps you were leaving us for good. For good, exclaimed Paddington. He collapsed into a nearby armchair at the thought. That wouldn't be for good, Mrs. Bird. That would be for bad. One thing, said Mr. Gruber, you'll be able to wash Mr. Brown's stains off after all. He can start afresh when he gets back. I think that's a very good idea, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington. If I'm going all the way to South America, I expect I shall pick up some very interesting new ones, especially in darkest Peru. I can't wait to bring them back. Browns were in the middle of breakfast when Mrs. Brown suddenly let out a cry. Good gracious, I've just remembered it's Mr. Curry's birthday today. Mr. Curry's birthday? <laughs> I didn't know Mr. Curry had birthdays. Everyone has birthdays, said Judy. Even Mr. Curry. I don't suppose the postman will be overworked. I can't imagine there being many cards. The Browns fell silent at the thought. It's really rather sad, said Mrs. Brown. I know he brings it on himself by being so bad-tempered, but we ought to do something for him. Perhaps, said Paddington hopefully, I could bake him a special birthday cake. Not in my kitchen oven you don't, said Mrs. Bird. It's only just been cleaned. You can have some ingredients if you like, but no cooking. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bird said Paddington, doubtfully. It was very nice being offered some ingredients, but he couldn't picture Mr. Curry being very excited by a cold cake. On the other hand, an idea began to form in the back of his mind, and the more he thought about it, the more excited he became, until by the time Mrs. Bird went out shopping later that morning, he could hardly contain himself. Mr. Brown had an old field oven in his garage. It had once been used for picnics, but that was long ago. Now, it was more of a toolbox than an oven. All the same, 
Paddington felt that given enough ingredients, he would be able to make a very good cake indeed. But if mixing a cake and getting it into the oven had its problems, getting it out again was sometimes even more difficult. And with a large bowl of icing sugar waiting to be used up, he wasn't quite sure what he was going to do. Mr. Curry gazed down at the cake Paddington had made for him. It's very kind of you, Bear, he said. Very kind indeed. It's untouched by hand said Paddington eagerly. I did it all by paw. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> well, mm. I didn't put any candles on top in case the heat damaged the ceiling. What's that? What do you mean by that, Bear? Are you suggesting... Perhaps you'd like to cut the cake, Mr. Curry. Mm. Yeah, all right. But special occasions demand special tools. I brought my best knife along. Oh, dear, I shouldn't use that if I were you, Mr. Curry. Nonsense, Bear. Stand back. I know what I'm doing. It can't have set that hard. Hasn't been time. Oh, oh Bear. Look at my knife. Paddington did warn you. Whatever did you make the icing with? Well, said Paddington, it's not so much what it's made with, Mrs. Bird. It's what it's on. I couldn't get the cake out of the oven, so I decided to leave it inside instead. It's what's known as a door cake. It saves having a cake tin, and it stays fresh for ages, if you give it half a chance. One morning, Paddington was pottering about in the garden when he happened to glance through a knot hole in Mr. Curry's fence. As he did so, he nearly fell over backwards with surprise at the sight which met his gaze. He'd never seen anything quite like it before. It seemed to be a cross between a very large hair net, which had been hung out to dry, and some extra large knitting, which had gone wrong. It was all very strange, and he was about to go indoors and tell Mrs. Bird all about it, when he had his second shock of the morning. Bear, what are you doing, Bear? Are you spying on me? Oh, no, Mr. Curry, gasped Paddington. I wouldn't do that. I was only trying to see what was going on. Hmm, haven't you ever come across a hammock before, Bear? Sailors used to sleep in them at one time. Nowadays, people have them in their gardens. I don't think I've ever seen a bed with holes in before, Mr. Curry. Is it safe? Safe? Why, of course it's safe. Oh, I didn't mean it wasn't a good one, Mr. Curry. It looked rather old. I mean, have you had it a long time? Well, <clears throat> I... <clears throat> For some reason, Mr. Curry seemed anxious to change the subject. How much do you weigh, Bell? Paddington considered the matter for a moment. It depends on how many marmalade sandwiches I've eaten, Mr. Curry. Mrs. Bird says I must weigh quite a lot sometimes. Hmm. Look, Bear, I'm going upstairs for a book. I shall only be gone five minutes. And while I'm away, you can test my hammock for me. Just to make sure it's safe and uh, comfortable. If you do it properly, I may let you have a go later on. After I've finished with it for the day. Thank you, Mr. Curry. <laughs> I shall look forward to that. 
If Paddington had never seen a hammock before, he had even less idea how to get into one. And he soon began to wish Mr. Curry had left him a book of instructions. Paddington had already disappeared. He'd had quite enough of hammocks for one day. His hammock, snorted Mrs. Bird, when Paddington told the others about his adventures with Mr. Curry. The shake of it. I put that hammock out for the dustmen only yesterday. It's been up in the loft for years. It had gone all rotten. Mr. Curry must have taken it before the dustmen arrived. He ought to think himself lucky he didn't go through it. Perhaps said Paddington hopefully. I could sew some holes together and make you a new one. There's no need. Daddy's bought a new one. Look, it's got a special stand, so it'll be much easier to get into and much safer when you're in. If you like Paddington, you can be the very first to test it. No, thank you, Mr. Brown, said Paddington politely. After you. In fact, after everyone. One afternoon, Paddington was making his way back to number 32 Windsor Gardens after doing the daily shopping, when he stopped by a building site for a rest and a quick snack. As he did so, he happened to glance through a nearby knot hole. Paddington liked knot holes, especially ones outside building sites. You never knew quite what to expect on the other side, and for once he wasn't disappointed. In fact, he was glad he was bending down, otherwise he might have fallen over backwards with surprise at the sight which met his eyes. The men weren't at all like the usual workmen. They were much too well dressed. But by the time he'd got his opera glasses out in order to take a closer look, they had disappeared. Paddington rubbed his eyes several times in order to make sure he wasn't dreaming, and then went on his way with a thoughtful expression on his face. It was all very mysterious, and it definitely needed investigating. Paddington stayed up late that night, writing the day's events down in his scrapbook and drawing a map of the area. After carefully marking in the spot where he'd seen the men burying the box, he added his special paw mark to show that it was genuine. And after setting his alarm clock in order to make sure he was up bright and early, he climbed into bed. Soon, he was fast asleep. The next day, Paddington arrived on the building site in very good time indeed. And having made sure no one was watching, he peered down into the hole. But to his disappointment, there was nothing to be seen. And he felt very glad he'd brought a spade with him. The more he dug, the more disappointed he became. In fact, apart from a piece of an old plate, there was nothing to be found. And he was just about to stop for some much-needed breakfast when he was startled by a loud cry from somewhere nearby. 
What's going on? What are you doing, Bell? That's my hole you're digging in. I'm sorry about this, Sir Reginald. I can't think how it happened. I'll have you know this is Sir Reginald Barker, the archaeologist. He's famous for his digs. Paddington backed away. From the way Sir Reginald was jabbing his finger, he could quite see how he got his reputation. Careful there. May I have a look at that, please? If you like, Sir Reginald, said Paddington, but I'm afraid it's a bit old. Old? Why, it must be early Roman if it's a day. Early Roman? exclaimed Paddington. But he was fresh yesterday. Mrs. Bird wouldn't let me eat anything that old. I'm not talking about your marmalade sandwich, Bear. I'm talking about this plate. It's just what we've been looking for. The missing piece to make up an almost perfect Roman dinner service made over a thousand years ago. Sir Reginald and the country are grateful. Fancy you digging up some Roman remains, Mr. Brown, said Mr. Gruber later that morning over their elevenses. Sir Reginald said they'd been looking for it for weeks, said Paddington. They'd given up because the builders were about to start work and they were going to bury a posterity box to mark the spot. That's what they were rehearsing yesterday. A posterity box, Mr. Brown? It's a box with lots of different objects inside to show people in the future what life was like today, explained Paddington. Sir Reginald said, I could put something in myself as a reward, if I like. How nice, said Mr. Gruber. And at least it's cleared up the mystery for you. But a difficult task, knowing what to choose. You are welcome to anything you can see, although I'm afraid it is all antique. Thank you very much, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington, but I think I may leave one of my sandwiches. If they dig it up in a hundred years' time, it'll probably be an even bigger mystery than the one I had to solve. Paddington came to fretwork fairly late, but once he discovered its joys, he certainly made up for lost time. He soon became quite good at cutting out shapes, and he made several pipe racks for Mr. Brown. Some decorated trinket boxes for Mrs. Bird and Mrs. Brown, and some name plates, one for Jonathan and one for Judy. But it was when he turned his attention to making a jigsaw puzzle as a present for Mr. Gruber that things really started to move. According to the instructions, all you needed was a sheet of plywood, some glue, an old picture, and a rolling pin. Mr. Brown had some plywood in his shed. Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird were out for the day, and as luck would have it, he'd seen their neighbour, Mr. Curry, put some old paintings out by his dustbin that very morning. Paddington felt sure that anything Mr. Curry threw out must be very unwanted indeed. But soon, he was hard at work.
Paddington felt very pleased with his jigsaw. Some of the pieces were more difficult to fit together than others, but gradually the picture began to take shape. Mr. Curry's painting was a reproduction of the Laughing Cavalier, and although he seemed to be smiling more out of the side of his face than he had before, it was still a very good likeness. Paddington felt sure Mr. Gruber would be more than delighted when he saw it. But before he had time to do any more, he was startled by a loud knocking noise. Can I come in, Bear? I'd like to use your telephone. I've just been robbed. And I must say it's not surprising if everyone goes out for the day. Oh, I've been here, Mr. Curry. I've been busy making a present. A present? That's very kind of you, Bear. Fancy you going to all that trouble just for me. Oh, I haven't been to any trouble for you, Mr. Curry. I wouldn't. I, I mean... There's no need to say another word, Bear. I like jigsaws. It's just what I need to take my mind off things. You probably won't believe this, but I stood some things outside my back door while I was decorating the hall and someone has stolen a priceless painting. I believe you, Mr. Curry. Bear, what are you doing, Bear? I can't see to do my jigsaw. Funnily enough, it's not unlike... Bear! What's the meaning of this? This is my picture, Bear! Come back, Bear! Priceless? Mr. Gruber gazed at the jigsaw. Did you say priceless, Mr. Prong? No, said Paddington. Mr. Curry did. Ah, that's different. If I'm not mistaken, this came off the lid of a chocolate box. That isn't the name of the artist in the corner. It's the manufacturer. I suggest we buy another box, Mr. Brown. Then Mr. Curry can have a new picture. You and I can share the chocolates with the family. And as for me, I really shall have something priceless. I don't suppose there are many genuine pears, jigsaw puzzles in the world. Unless, of course, you are thinking of going into production in a big way, Mr. Brown. Oh no, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington. If I did that, I think it might be the unkindest saw cut of them all. <laughs> <laughs>